Hello. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, those of you gathered in the room with us today, as well as those of you who will be joining us over Zoom for this live uh, hybrid webinar slash symposium uh, entitled Building Bridges Over Walls. Uh, and the subtitle has changed repeatedly. Eastern European literature and translation networks in the upper Midwest, Eastern Central and Central European literature, Eastern and Central and Central Asian literature, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, really the point uh, of, uh, of today's meeting uh, or series of events is to celebrate uh, a long legacy of publishing, translating, and promoting the literature of Eastern and Central Europe, as well as Central Asia. Uh, here in the upper Midwest, uh, it is not an exaggeration to say that Eastern li European literature and the literature of the former Soviet Union and its satellite countries uh, would not be the same today were it not for the activity of scholars, translators, editors, and enthusiasts in the upper Midwest from the Cold War uh, all the way up to the present. And just to give an illustrative example, as we, uh, uh, among us, a group of graduate students and myself, were working on uh, surveying and just beginning to document these networks, uh, what we quickly discovered was that if we just count the publications that were made in Ann Arbor during the post-war period, uh, including the activities of artists, publishers, which was started by Carl and Ellen Dea Proffer in the early 1970s, uh, Hermitage Publishers, which was started just uh, about a decade later, also in Ann Arbor, and Michigan Slavic Publications, which is still to this day published out of the Slavic department here at the University of Michigan. Between those three publishing operations, we'd be talking about a thousand titles of uh, published, book, book titles published uh, in roughly a quarter century. Uh, titles that were often banned in their countries of origins, certainly authors who were unknown to English language readers until their work was translated. And in very, very many instances, books that were published, in fact, not in translation, but in their original languages, Polish, Russian, and others, and then in many instances smuggled back into their countries of origins where they could not be published legally. And we'll be looking at all kinds of fun, interesting examples of this, as well as in instances of contemporary uh, translation and publishing that is that are uh, that are uh, extending and continuing that that legacy. So that is the plan for today. It is uh, our, our uh, events today are designed to be public facing and celebratory. I think that given the events of the last two years and especially the events of the last three weeks, we could all use uh, a little bit of celebration of why uh, we uh, have become fascinated with uh, the cultural products of this part of the world. There will be several events throughout the day. Uh, you are free to uh, tune in and out as your schedules permit, or to uh, for U of M affiliates, students, faculty, staff, you're welcome to join us here in this room on the 10th floor of Weiser Hall on the campus of the University of Michigan. Those of you who are joining us over Zoom, and I'll be saying this throughout the day, uh, please, if you do have questions or comments for our speakers, you can place those in the Q&A uh, at the bottom of your Zoom screens. Uh, we will be monitoring that Q&A and then feeding those questions to our panelists who will not be making presentations of formal academic arguments uh, or, uh, or formal academic research. We're going to be speaking largely informally and sharing our various enthusiasms. So the program for the day will consist of an initial uh, panel, um, which I will introduce in, in just a moment, uh, consisting of uh, Piotr Vesvalevich, uh, a lecturer here in the Department of Slavic Languages and Literatures, and uh, Professor uh, uh, Herbert Eagle, who's a professor of Slavic Languages and Literatures and Film, uh, who will we'll be talking about the, specifically about the Ann Arbor uh, portion of this uh, somewhat sprawling legacy in the, of publishing in the Upper Midwest. Um, at 11 o'clock, we will reconvene after a 15-minute break to uh, 
hear our graduate students, some of our graduate students, uh, talking about the things that they found with a great deal of enthusiasm uh, connected with this material. It didn't take too much, I think, because in, uh, for all of us who are working on this project, we simply looked at our own bookshelves and found that a huge amount of what drew us into our early training in Eastern and Central European literatures and Central Asian literatures was stuff that just happened to uh, come out of the upper Midwest. And uh, I was talking a moment ago about uh, one particular copy of a book by Marina Tsvetaeva that I have out on the display table outside. It's my own personal copy of the first, one of the first books of Eastern European literature I ever encountered. Um, I think I was a, my first semester of my freshman year of college. And uh, it's also the, probably the first time I ever heard of the town of Ann Arbor because that book was published by artists. And it says Ann Arbor inside, and I was just kind of curious about where this came from. And, uh, and of course, like so much, it got out of hand. Uh, after uh, a break for lunch, uh, we will uh, have uh, some presentations by out-of-town guests, two panels uh, back to back. Uh, one uh, on Tamizdat, that is the phenomenon of publishing uh, literature still untranslated and then often smuggling it back into its point of origin. And, uh, a, and, a, and then another panel on the current legacy, uh, the continuing story of uh, publishing in Eastern and Central, of uh, publishing Eastern and Central European literatures in the upper Midwest. And then finally, we will finish the day with a celebratory reading of poetry, primarily poetry in, uh, tr in translation by uh, Claire Kavanaugh. Uh, very often when uh, translator scholars like Professor Kavanaugh are brought to campus, they are brought to give papers about their research. Uh, we thought that in this instance, let's change it up. Let's actually celebrate the, the, and hear the poetry that, uh, that, that draws us in. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce our first uh, discussion. Um, uh, and we, on the schedule, it says that we have three speakers. Unfortunately, Professor Yinjik Toman is, uh, is unwell and is unable to join us today. So we will have two speakers. Um, the first speaker, I believe the first person to speak is going to be Professor Eagle. Is that right? Or is it was Piot? Oh, thank you very much. So the other way around. Um, so Piotr Vesvalevich is a lecturer in Polish uh, literature and culture in the Department of Slavic Languages and Literatures here at the University of Michigan. He's been teaching at the University of Michigan for, I believe, 31 years. Do I have it right? Since 1989, so even more, uh, um, and has, uh, and has th therefore uh, not only participated in, but of course borne witness to uh, all of the, very much of the publishing activity that we're talking about. He, uh, he also holds his doctorate in Slavic languages and literatures from the University of Michigan um, and is a very uh, important member of our community. Uh, the, I, I'm, I'm, instead of introducing you individually, I'll just introduce everyone at once. Um, after uh, um, uh, Piotr Vesvalevich speaks, uh, Herbert Eagle will, will uh, address us. He is... Um, as I mentioned, professor of Slavic languages and literatures and film, and also a professor appointed in the residential college at the University of Michigan. He has served as the director of the university's uh, film and video studies program, director of the residential college, chair of the Department of Slavic languages and literatures, and has published articles on Sergei Eisenstein, the semiotics of cinema, the work of East European filmmakers such as Menzo, Hitilova, Vaida, Polanski, Kishlovsky and many others, and his books include Russian Formalist Film Theory, 1981, uh, a volume co-edited with Anna Lawton, uh, Words and Revolution, Russian Futurist Manifestos, 1912 to 1918, uh, which was republished in 2006, um, and, uh, and he's the author of uh, many articles on semiotics and film. So uh, please join me in welcoming our two speakers for the first panel. Uh, Mr. Uh, 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 Piotr Vesvalevich and uh, Herbert Eagle. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good, good sunny morning to everybody. It's, I, I have never been in this room with the shades up, so this is spectacular. It's, it looks beautiful. So it's a good setting. Uh, let me, I have a few pictures that I want to share. Let me quickly find those. Where 
is the first one. And then I will scroll as we go. Um, as soon as I received the email from Professor Paloff uh, announcing uh, the 2022 Mellon Sawyer Seminar, I felt I had to take advantage of this opportunity to celebrate the many achievements of current and former faculty and students of the University of Michigan Department of Slavic Languages and Literatures with small amount of discomfort because I come from a culture where self-congratulation and self-promotion is frowned upon and is perceived in a negative light, but now I've been here long enough that I'm almost over that. Uh, and, and incidentally, this is one of the main themes in one of the works that I will uh, mention. Um, we do have an impressive record in translation and popularization of Slavic literatures in the United States of America and among English language readers across the globe. Uh, I have, as Professor Paloff mentioned, I have been affiliated with the U of M Slavic department for a long time as a student since 87, as a teacher since 89, uh, due, due to an accident of fate, a Polish lecture packing up and leaving in the middle of the semester, I, I started teaching as an undergraduate uh, because I spoke Polish, so I was qualified. Uh, so this, is, th this tribute is also my personal journey back in time. Uh, among a host of accomplished fellow students, students and faculty members are Jonathan Bolton, Vlad Beronia, Kelly Miller, uh, Christopher Ford, and many others who translated from Czech, Russian, Serbo-Croatian, and other Slavic languages. Uh, I would like to focus on translations from Polish because this is my field and this is what uh, I enjoy the most. Uh, I would like to uh, start by paying tribute to Professor Bognana Carpenter, uh, the first full-time uh, Polish literature professor at the U of M, and for all practical purposes, the founder of the Polish program at the U of University of Michigan. Uh, Bogdana Carpenter and her husband, John, uh, are a translating team, and they have delivered outstanding English versions of poetry by Spigniew Herbert and Julia Hartwig. But perhaps most importantly, Bogdana Carpenter produced a bilingual anthology of Polish literature from the Middle Ages to Enlightenment, Monumenta Polonica, and you have the cover right in front of you. Uh, this anthology continues to be used by many Polish programs around the world today, Professor Carpenter was also my teacher and mentor, and I remain grateful for many, many lessons learned and moments to remember. Um, another translating team I would like to celebrate consists of Eva Pasek, uh, a current faculty member at the University of Michigan Slavic Department, teaching things like Polish language and Czech language and things related to Polish culture, and Megan Thomas. Together, they have translated two novels so far, the romance of Teresa Hennard and the career of Nicodemus Dysma. In particular, the second title um, is of huge importance. It has been a cult novel uh, in Polish culture since the interwar period when it first came out, and it continues to be this way after and even today during the Third Republic. Uh, it is crucial to the understanding of the collective Polish psyche today for example, this discomfort with self-promotion, self-celebration, and suspicion of fraud when we face those. Um, and if you wish to know what it means to be Polish, this is the book to read. Um, and I have right here the very pretty cover of the translation. It came out very recently, I think over the last couple of years. And it's, it's one of my personal favorite novels, so I, I am permanently grateful to have it in English now. Um, the engine and the idea man behind this event, Professor Paloff, contributes to the dissemination and popularization of Polish literature with an output that is impressive both in scope and in quality. He has translated many books and many literary and theoretical texts from Polish, Czech, Russian, Yiddish. The Polish authors he has introduced to English language readers so far are Dorota Masłowska, Marek Bieńczyk, and Andrzej Sosnowski, and I may be missing some names. Uh, one cannot overestimate the crucial importance of making contemporary authors accessible to the students and readers of any foreign, li foreign literature. Uh, Professor Paloff creates a gateway for those who love and will fall in love with Polish literature and culture. And here is the cover of a translation of uh, Dorota Masłowska's novel. And this is uh, um, 
again, one of my personal favorites, and it's, it, it is a very important uh, novel in terms of understanding the new developments in Polish prose. It is the, the, the new way of writing that now is important. Finally, I would like to pay tribute to Margarita Navpaktitis, currently a curator of Slavic and East European collections at Stanford Libraries. Margarita Navpaktitis was a student in my first year Polish class many, many years ago when I was young, handsome, and dashing, or perhaps just young. Uh, she translated Tales of Galicia by Andrzej Stasiuk in 1995. And here I would like to engage in a small exercise in nostalgia, not, not necessarily for anything other than friendships and good times with people I, I like. There are many things not to be nostalgic for. Uh, the translation of uh, Stasiuk's work will always remind me of one of the best research trips I ever took to Poland. Uh, in my quest for new authentic materials, I traveled all over Poland for about a week and I took this long trip from Kraków to Gdańsk and back. It was a great adventure. I mostly lived on pastries the entire week. Um, and I'm still alive. Uh, and uh, men, men, many ponski were used to fuel that, that research project. On a trip from Kraków to Gdańsk, I was accompanied uh, by Margarita Nafaktidis and Kelly Miller. Uh, Margarita was in Poland at the time working on a translation of Stasiuk's text, and Kelly was doing her doctoral research. So we got on a train, we went to Gdańsk, and uh, we had plenty of hours to kill, and one of the things we did is we were working on all sorts of problem spots in the translation, trying to piece things together that Margarita wasn't totally comfortable she was getting right, which she was, by the way. Um, our compartment, our, our grand second class compartment wasn't full, but there were two or three fellow travelers with us. And um, it didn't take that long to engage everybody in the project. Um, uh, uh, we were uh, talking and joking, great, at times silly fun was had by all, trying to translate, translate words like gajik uh, from language to language and from culture to culture. Whenever I reread Margarita's translation, uh, I think of the trainer ride and, and the uh, spectacular nutritional achievements of mine and, and of Gajik. And I would like to show you. The, 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 these are the ponczki. <laughs> they, they are spectacular in small amounts. And, and here is Gajik. Um, and I, 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 after all that work and, and having read it a number of times, I still don't remember exactly how she translated it. Uh, I'm sure I missed many names in my tribute, and I welcome any and all additions and corrections to my very informal celebration of current and former U of M Slavic Department faculty members and graduates and students. I'm looking at the audience, and here's Tanya Silverman, who very recently translated a number of texts from Czech, pop, punk, and rock music for the class on Polish rock poetry. So it, it keeps going on, which is wonderful. Uh, th there must be more people that I mentioned. Eva Van Pusitz and Katarzyna Zehenter come to mind. Uh, and if anybody can throw some names at me, that would be great. Uh, I, I find it striking and impressive how a very, very small team can, can compete, so to speak, on a global stage and do so much. As Professor Paylov said, a, a thousand titles or more. That's spectacular. So, well done, Slavic Department. Thank you. Thanks. I'm going to do a little history as well, and it will intersect somewhat with what Piotr has just told you about, but uh, go back a little earlier that uh, my initial contact with the important translation work at the University of Michigan Slavic Department actually occurred uh, beginning when I was a graduate student here um, in the late 1960s. Um, and I want to foreground in my remarks um, important work by four people here uh, in our department. Um, first, Professor Ladislav Maciek, uh, 
who uh, began the efforts, uh, large-scale efforts of translation here. Uh, then Carl and Ellen Dea Proffer, uh, I'm sure almost all of you know about their work with artists. And finally, my colleague, uh, Yinjik Toman, who's unable to be here today, who has continued uh, the efforts that Professor Matika began at, at Slavic um, uh, publications. Um, the very first things that were uh, published by Michigan Slavic publications, to my knowledge, were actually not translations, but originals. That um, Professor Matika, who had begun his career in Prague as a journalist, uh, le left Czechoslovakia in 1948, um, subsequently went to Harvard, where he was a student of Roman Jakobsen, and then took a, a professorial position here. And at a time that American New Criticism had first brought uh, the work of some Russian formalists, particularly Viktor Shlovsky and uh, his important article, uh, Art as Device, Iskuska Kak Priom, uh, to the attention of, of American scholars, um, uh, Matika was devoted to bringing to the attention of uh, an English reading public the much larger work of, of many Russian formalists who people here had not heard of, and, in, and also including an equal number of members of the Prague School, Czech structuralists, who were uh, virtually unknown, perhaps, with the exception of Roman Jakobsen and Jan Mukashovsky. So, um, the first, the first editions were actually intended for graduate students here, and they were uh, Russian originals of works that were hard to come by, and published very simply and very simply bound, almost like notebooks. And I think some of them were actually mimeographed. This was before the days of Xerox, even. Uh, but then, toward the end of the 60s, um, the efforts began to translate these important works into English. So these are works of um, literary theory and history, by and large. And uh, the first of those projects, and uh, the first one that I participated in, I don't have slides, so you'll have to, uh, was uh, Readings in Russian Poetics, Formalist and, and Structuralist Views. Um, and this volume contains some really really key articles uh, by Jakobsen, Tinyanov, Eichenbaum, uh, Tomaszewski, uh, that had never been translated before into uh, English. And uh, Professor Machika basically recruited us graduate students to do uh, some of these translations along with uh, two of his colleagues on the faculty, Erwin Titunic and Mark Sweeno, uh, to produce this volume. And it, it was really, uh, I have to say, a personal thrill for me to be part of, of bringing you know, some of these uh, classic texts to the uh, English-speaking uh, public. Um, I got to translate a very important manifesto article written by uh, Jakobsen and Tinyanov toward the end of the 20s, and also a very important um, piece by Roman Jakobsen on the dominant, Dominanta, which I actually got to translate from Jakobsen's handwritten notes, because the article was, had never been published as such by Jakobsen himself, and uh, Machika thought we would basically recreate it from the notes uh, to a lecture that he gave in, uh, at Masaryk University in Brno in 1935. Uh, and uh, at that point, you know, I had come here uh, having studied Russian as an undergraduate, but really just began my study of Czech here at the University of Michigan. I think I had had one year of Czech when I uh, tackled this, uh, this piece by Jakobsen. Fortunately, uh, as many of you know, a uh, lit literary theoretical work has a lot of borrowings from French and English and a lot of words that are calques from those languages. So since I had the basic grammar down, I was able to do that. I think I, I also want to mention, um, thinking about events going on right now, 
and about the solidarity that has been expressed by scholars and artists across Russia and Ukraine uh, amidst this, this horrible destruction and loss of human life, um, uh, that there is a great deal, of course, of, of, of connection among Slavic peoples and scholars that uh, not only formalist and structuralist theory, but post-structuralist theory is filled with the names of scholars from Russia and Eastern Europe. So I want to note that perhaps what I think is perhaps the best piece describing Russian formalism, Boris Eichensbaum's theory of the formal method, which was translated in this volume, was actually translated from its first publication in Ukrainian. Um, this was followed a few years later by another uh, companion volume um, called Semiotics of Art, which had a uh, translation of uh, many of the works of the, of the Czech structuralists. Um, and uh, the graduate students who participated in those efforts uh, went on, uh, in many cases, to, uh, to translate um, works of their own. So, this kind of, this effort, this translation effort radiated out from Ann Arbor uh, to other places among people who, are, who were later very prominent uh, in the field, who contributed as graduate students to this effort, uh, just to name a few, uh, were uh, Jerry and I believe uh, Susan Janicek, later at the University of Kentucky, Kenneth Brostrom, uh, at Wayne Strait, State, and Michael Henry Heim, who as a graduate student contributed to uh, the Semiotics of Art volume. So um, this was the kind of initial uh, effort, and it was largely devoted to literary theory and criticism. And then it expanded in the 70s into the, uh, the translation of a lot of the early works of Soviet semiotics. So. Um, Volumes by Lotman were translated uh, here, uh, among many others. Um, just a brief per personal note, um, uh, getting involved in, in translation and uh, finding it you know, really rewarding. I went on, uh, my first job was at uh, Purdue University. And uh, there, together with a couple of colleagues at Purdue, Anna Lawton and Zina Brzezinskaya, we embarked on uh, two separate uh, translation projects. One of them was to uh, translate the work of Russian formalists about cinema, which were virtually unknown. Uh, people knew about Eisenstein, and to the extent that anyone writing in film studies about Russian formalist film theory, they wrote about Eisenstein, who they considered to be uh, the, the primary uh, uh, contributor to such theory, but in fact, um, it was Tinyanov, Eichenbaum, Shklovsky, who actually were writing about cinema first and earlier, and some of Eisenstein's ideas can be, in my view, actually traced to Tinyanov. So uh, we translated a volume that had been published in the Soviet Union in the mid-1920s called Paetika Kino, and it was later published by Michigan Slavic publications as um, Russian formalist film theory. And it, it ended up, I think, uh, informing a lot of people in film studies about um, some of these important concepts that uh, the Russian formalists had developed in extending their work from uh, literature into film. And then later, Anna Lawton and I, about a year or two later, um, uh, translated many of the Russian futurist uh, manifestos. And that was published by Cornell University Press and later um, republished by Anna Lawton's publishing house in Washington. Um, Machika's work continued then in the 70s with a completely new venture. And this was a thick journal called Cross Currents, which was devoted to East and Central European literature and uh, featured uh, the works of 
Polish, Czech, Hungarian uh, authors, uh, m much of it fiction, uh, some poetry, uh, some critical articles, and then articles by uh, scholars from Eastern Europe as well as the United States about those works. And this was a, in a, at a very important period. It was in the wake of the suppression of the Prague Spring in 1968. And, uh, and it's so, it sort of kept uh, Central Europe as part of the Western humanist tradition prominent uh, during years when um, artists and scholars in those countries were experiencing uh, various degrees of uh, oscillating repression, you could say, in the 1960s, 70s, and into the 80s. Um, Carl and Inde uh, Ellen Dea Proffer arrived uh, at the University of Michigan, coming from Indiana, if my memory serves me correctly, uh, roughly around 1970. Uh, and Carl embarked on uh, his artist project, which began as a kind of hobby. I remember uh, my wife and I having dinner at Carl's and Ellen Dea's shortly after they, after they launched the project, and they lived in a rather small apartment here in Ann Arbor, uh, the front room of which was completely filled by a new typesetting machine that Carl had gotten. And he and Ellen Dea were typesetting everything themselves at that point. Um, and their uh, initial project was to reprint in some case, facsimile editions, which uh, Benjamin has mentioned, uh, important uh, works of Russian literature from the symbolist, acmeist period uh, that had uh, basically gone out of print and were essentially unavailable, uh, but perhaps largely because of their interventions into the life of Joseph Brodsky, who they helped bring to Michigan, uh, they immediately turn to an important task, which is um, keeping alive the literature of contemporary Russian authors who could not publish in their, in their own country. Uh, so this was now an effort at uh, uh, translating um, works uh, by those authors. And um, artists was a, a very vibrant place. And once again, a graduate students of, at the University of Michigan were heavily involved at all levels, from working as translators to uh, packing up the books when they were, when they were shipped out after uh, Carl and Ellen Dea succeeded in getting a larger place. They purchased the clubhouse of a golf course, which sat on top of a hill. And it was from, from that place that they went on to uh, produce many volumes. Um, I think I'm about out of time if we're going to have any Q&A time. So I will end here. And uh, if there's anything that you'd like me to follow up on, I'd be happy to do that. I, uh, the one person, though, I need to mention is Professor Toman. That after Professor Matika retired, Professor Toman took over at Michigan Slavic Publications and uh, was instrumental in continuing those efforts of uh, publishing works from uh, Eastern Europe and, and Russia. And I also did want to, I know Piotr already had a slide of this, that Monumenta Polonica, this volume, which is, these volumes arose because as graduate students at the University of Michigan, we were expected to master two Slavic languages and literatures. But at, for the second Slavic language and literature, we basically took a year-long survey course of the masterworks of that literature. And, and these volumes arose out of our needs to have these, and that's why they were printed in the original with translation. And they were done not only for Polish literature, so there's a similar volume. I think it might be entitled uh, Monumenta Serba Croatica. And uh, there's works of Czech literature under other titles that were published in this way. Thank you. Please, please stay. Yeah, I think. Not I, sit uh, down? No, well, unless you, unless you really want to sit down.
No, I don't want to sit down. <laughs> you were just told to sit down. Uh, no, no, Maybe. I, um, Is Piotr coming? No, he, Piotr, Piotr's Piotr, gone to a class. Yes, I'm afraid yeah. Piotr had to leave for class, but the, the, I think you're in an excellent position to answer the first question that came in over Zoom. Okay. Which is from uh, Professor Yopi Prince, who's the chair of the Department of Comparative Literature, which I should also mention is a co-sponsor of this event. I'm almost certain, though, as I introduced the event, I'm, as usual, I probably s skipped over mentioning our sponsors. Uh, this, this event is sponsored by the Center for Russian, East European, and Eurasian Studies, as well as the Department of Comparative Literature, um, as part of its Mellon Sawyer seminars. And Professor Prince asks, uh, or says, it is fascinating to hear about the distinguished history of translation in the Slavic department. I'm curious to hear more about Joseph Brodsky's contribution to this history through his teaching of Russian poetry and world poetry and his interests in translation. Did he encourage students and colleagues to translate? And is the University of Michigan associated with a particular style or idea about translating Eastern European poets? Wow. Those are, those are great questions. Um, and unfortunately, I don't think I know the answer to either one. Uh, Joseph Brodsky taught um, Russian poetry in our department. Um, his, his teaching of it was in some ways unconventional. Uh, um, and again, most of this I know only very slightly that he really focused on the sound texture of poems. Uh, any, any poem that was uh, discussed was preceded by Joseph Brodsky reading it in his very characteristic personal poetic intonation, which if you've ever heard him read, is unmistakable. He almost sang poems. In fact, I, I think I would say he did. Um, and, um, you know, Brodsky himself was not particularly educated in this uh, Russian formalist text structuralist uh, tradition. Uh, so he, I think, made little use of that literary uh, theory in, in his teaching. And as to whether he was, in, in a way, encouraging graduate students here to continue translation work or not, I don't know. But I know that it did continue during the decade. The decade that he was here was a very productive one. Uh, for translations and graduate students at Michigan continued to participate in the publication of many different volumes and, and some of them went on to, uh, to actually publish works of their own that were works of translation as Piot mentioned uh, for the case of Polish. Um, so uh, not sure and as to whether there was a particular um, Michigan approach to translation. Again, I don't know for sure, but my impression would be that there wasn't, that uh, the most important project for, for Machika and for Professor Toman was actually getting these works out and getting them out quickly in the case of cross currents, because it, it was all, you know, very important in this decade where those countries in East Central Europe were struggling for greater uh, autonomy. Um, so I think the translators were left to their own devices uh, in terms of how they approached translation. Thank you. Are there any other, are there any questions, uh, other questions from either over Zoom or from our live audience? It's not a question. Um, it's just, I, I guess, a kind of a belated thank you. I had no idea how many of the books I've had on my shelves since I was an undergraduate and a graduate student. And I have artist editions back from the 70s. I have my little reprints of Mandelstam that were sometimes the first things you got a hold of or the only um, facsimile editions. Everything I just hadn't, and the readings in Russian poetics, my copy is um, um, package taped together because it's been Xeroxed out of too many times. Um, so this is just to say I hadn't realized how much I owed this institution. Um, I've, I've been at um, UC Santa Cruz, Harvard, Wisconsin, and um, Northwestern, and I have your guys' stuff with me wherever I've been. <laughs> so thank you. 
Yeah, the, the original battered edition of uh, readings in Russian poetics is probably the MIT Press edition. It was published. Yeah, it was first. Uh, it was first published by MIT Press, as was the Semiotics of Art, and uh, the one I was holding up is actually a later um, Michigan Slavic Publications reprint uh, of it. Once MIT Press basically returned the copyrights to. Machika, he decided to reprint it here. And those reprints are also an interesting and important part of this yeah. story, right? Um, and, and we will be talking about Northwestern University Press and Dalkey Archive Press being major forces in, in what we call recovery publishing, the stuff yeah, that just gets lost right. and then needs to be brought back into print. Yeah, um, a, number, a number of things have been uh, you know, published by um, more than one press in either order. Sometimes another press published it, and then it was republished by Michigan Slavic Public, or in some cases the reverse, where uh, things were published here first and then picked up by a major press and republished. Are there any other questions for now? Um, of course, there, begin, there can be questions throughout the day. Uh, in that case, thank you very much uh, okay. to uh, Piotr Pesarlevich in absentia and, and, and very much uh, to uh, Professor uh, Eagle uh, for these um, wonderful institutional memories. <laughs> and uh, we, uh, we will reconvene in 15 minutes. Uh, for those of you who are in the room live, we have Kava i Piechevo in the back uh, uh, by the beautiful view of the, the plate glass windows. And uh, in 15 minutes, we will um, reconvene to uh, go over at, at 11 uh, uh, a.m. We will, we will go over uh, some of those, kind of a show and tell of, of those materials from the bookshelves, the things we pulled off our bookshelves that we then constructed into a visual, uh, a brief visual history um, online. And we'll be sharing that in, in a few minutes. So please uh, stay tuned. <laughs>